Hello everybody out there in Bourbon Real Talk land. Randy Sullivan coming to you with a special episode. And what we are going to talk about today is your top 10 alternatives to Pappy Van Winkle. So first off, as is the use, we're going to go into a little bit of history about the brand. So Pappy Van Winkle, interestingly enough, does not make whiskey. They are non-distiller producers, or at least they used to be. A non-distiller producer is a whiskey brand that has uh, some licensing right to release whiskey under an intellectual property set, in this case the Van Winkle line, but they don't necessarily make the whiskey that they sell. And Pappy Van Winkle was a line that was purchasing product from a now defunct distillery called Stitzelweller. And Stitzelweller was an amazing producer of whiskey. I've had many other products. Everything I've tried from there has been amazing. Uh, but they suffered during the bourbon dark ages when people weren't really buying bourbon. And unfortunately, they ended up going out of business. And during the bourbon dark ages, they had all of this product that was aging. And one of the interesting things about Stitzelweller is they made the Weller line of weeded bourbon. And they had product that they had made for future release, but they just didn't have a whole lot of people to purchase it. And when you have whiskey that's aging and you have to pay taxes on it when you bottle it and you don't have anybody to buy it, you don't bottle it. You leave it in the warehouse and let it age a little bit more. But the problem was is back until, I mean, honestly, it wasn't until the 2000s that age statements above eight years or 10 years became popular for bourbon. And the reason why is because most people believe that bourbon really hit its stride at six to eight years. And a lot of people thought that if a bourbon was more than eight years old, then it meant that there was something wrong with it because nobody wanted to buy it. And so here comes the Van Winkle family that starts a line called Pappy Van Winkle. And they're able to source these really high age barrels that had been sitting around in the Stitzelweller uh, warehouse. And they were a weeded bourbon. So they were a little bit different from what else was on the market. And as it turned out, this whiskey was pretty good. And this was also during a time frame where blind bourbon tasting competitions started to gain a little bit more popularity as more people became interested in the, in the product category. And Pappy Van Winkle started to win a lot of competitions in the late 2000s. Um, they had higher age statements and they, those higher age statements were able to attract a category of bourbon buyer that hadn't been there before. And that was Scotch buyer. Scotch most premium scotches start at 18 years old. And so when you're looking at bourbon from the viewpoint of a scotch drinker, where an ultra premium scotch might be 30 years old, an eight year old bourbon just doesn't sound like that much. But I mean, we understand that there's differences in aging because of the, the climates are different, but that wasn't really well known information back there. And so what happened is Scotch buyers started to be interested in this bourbon that had these higher age statements that were more similar to what they were thinking about for a premium product. And at the time, Pappy Van Winkle wasn't expensive for its age compared to its contemporaries over in Scotland. And so more people became interested. And as they became more interested, the number of Google searches for Van Winkle and Pappy Van Winkle skyrocketed around 2010. And that really created the birth of the secondary market. Uh, bottles like Pappy Van Winkle and Buffalo Trace Antique Collection and things of the like made it so that people who were getting the product were able to sell it to others who couldn't get the product at a premium. And the secondary market grew with the creation of Bourbon Secondary Market on, on Facebook, which was a Facebook group that got shut down a couple of years ago. And it caused the growth of the secondary market, which caused the growth of Pappy Van Winkle and the other Van Winkle products to just become meteoric. Um, everybody wanted a bottle. And then you add on top of all of that, the Pappy heist. So if you don't know, there was an employee of a distillery that ended up stealing a bunch of Pappy Van Winkle. And um, it's this crazy story. There's a documentary about it that recently came out. Um, the guy was taking steroids as a performance enhancement drug for his uh, uh, softball team. It was like, it, it's just a, a bunch of craziness. It's kind of an entertaining story. But the fact that there was this national news story about a whiskey brand that was so valuable that somebody stole a bunch of it, it really sensationalized it and it increased the desire for Pappy Van Winkle even more. 
Now let's let's talk about the Van Winkle line, and I say the Van Winkle line and not the Pappy Van Winkle line because all Pappy is Van Winkle, but not all Van Winkle is Pappy. And I will warn you that if you are newer to the whiskey world and you get involved in the enthusiast community, and you refer to this bottle that I have over here to the left of me as ten-year Pappy, someone is going to jump down your throat um, because. It's the, the, there are several different Van Winkle products. So there's the old Rip Van Winkle 10 year, which is 107 proof. There is the Van Winkle Lot B 12 year, which is 90.4 proof. And then there's the Van Winkle Family Reserve Rye 13 year, which is 95.6 proof. So far, we haven't said the word Pappy, and there's a reason for it. And the Pappy line starts at 15 years. So you've got Pappy Van Winkle 15 year at 107 proof, Pappy Van Winkle 20 year at 90.4 proof, and Pappy Van Winkle 23 year at 95.6 proof. So Pappy Van Winkle are technically just those last three bottles, 15, 20, and 23 bourbons all weeded. Now in 2002, Pappy Van Winkle had to switch from the Stitzelweller juice that they were selling to Buffalo Trace. And when they made the switch, they technically switched from being a non-distiller producer that was buying finished product that was not made for them and putting it into their label to something that was different. I, I don't know whether or not technically it would be considered a licensing arrangement where they licensed the Pappy Van Winkle line to Buffalo Trace in exchange for a percentage of bottle sales or whatever, because I'm unaware of what their contract is, or if this would technically be considered contract distillation where they have a contract with Buffalo Trace to produce a certain number of barrels specifically for the Pappy Van Winkle line, but they are technically probably no longer an NDP and something else, some sort of a hybrid. Uh, Buffalo Trace only has one weeded mash bill and that's gonna be crucial when you start to look for alternatives and they make other products with it. So as we talk about alternatives, we're gonna talk about alternatives based on different elements of the product. And the first thing that I wanna talk about is alternatives based on the mash bill. Now, as we mentioned, Pappy Van Winkle is a weeded bourbon. Basically what that means, bourbon has to be at least 51% corn. There's a second grain that goes in there that's generally referred to as the flavor grain. And for almost all bourbons, that flavor grain is rye. And then because of the enzymes that are necessary to break down the sugars for the fermentation process, pretty much all bourbons, but not all, but pretty much all, especially the popular ones, have a measure of malted barley in them. Pappy Van Winkle doesn't have that right. It's got the wheat, and that's going to lead us to some potential alternatives. So the first alternative that I'm going to mention, which is almost pointless because this is hard to find as Pappy Van Winkle, is William LaRue Weller. William LaRue Weller is a Buffalo Trace product that is made from the exact same mash bill, except for it is cash strength. So as I mentioned, when I went through the Van Winkle line, all of those products receive some measure of proofing down before they get put into the bottle. William LaRue Weller could have been made into Pappy Van Winkle. It wasn't, it was made into WLW, but they don't proof it down, so it's cash strength. Part of the reason why I mention that is because if you do research, they'll tell you how old the barrels were that went into the William LaRue Weller releases, and they are also 12-year-old barrels for the most part, or at least the last few years have been. And so the difference between William LaRue Weller and Van Winkle Lot B 12-year is only proof. They're made from the same barrel, same mash bill, aged in the same warehouses, and it's a cash strength product, which most of us would consider a premium product because you're getting more of that aged product instead of just proofing water, which is adding no flavor whatsoever. I also find it super interesting if you go to a restaurant that has William Lou Weller and Van Winkles, if the WLW is less money than the Van Winkle, always order the WDLW because it's the same thing. It's just more whiskey and less water. Uh, the second alternative that I'm going to give you is Weller 12, because Weller 12 is the same as Lot B. Uh, the only difference between the two is Lot B is a 12-year product that's 90.4 proof. 
uh, Weller 12 is a 12 year product that is 90 proof. Now, I will say that there is a barrel selection process and they select the barrels that they believe taste like Weller for Weller and they select the barrels that taste like Van Winkle for Van Winkle. But the truth is that they're blending those barrels together for the batches that gets released and that, that blending together of barrels or marrying together of barrels, if you will, probably levels out a lot of the distinctive points that make one taste like one and not the other to the point where most people in a blind can't tell the difference between Weller 12 and Lot B. Um, next alternative would be Weller Antique or Old Weller Antique. Um, I mentioned Old Weller Antique because a few years ago, due to demand, Buffalo Trace dropped their 10-year age statement on their Old Weller Antique. They rebranded, they got a different bottle shape, and they dropped the word old, and now it's just called Weller Antique. It is bottled at 107 proof. It used to be 10 years. So there again, Old Weller Antique and Old Rip Van Winkle were at the same proof and the same age of the same mash bill in the same barrels aged in the same warehouses. So Weller Antique is a great alternative to Pappy Van Winkle. The next one is the little brother to the previous two or three, if you will, and that is Weller Special Reserve. That is the green label bottle. That one is the easiest to find, depending on where you live. Here in Texas, it is typically on the shelves. I can usually find it. It is inexpensive. It is a great drinker, and it is literally the exact same whiskey that goes into the Pappy Van Winkle bottle, except it is younger and the proof is different. Uh, but if you're looking for alternatives, obviously, if it could have turned into Van Winkle, that's a great alternative. But since we're talking about mash bills and we're talking about weeded bourbons, another overlooked whiskey that I feel like is a great alternative, especially to the younger Van Winkle lines, is Maker's Mark 101. Maker's Mark typically is not released at 101 proof. But they've recently started a new product line that originally was only available in duty-free shops. But I think because of COVID and the, res the restriction on travel and fewer people being exposed to duty-free shops, they decided to release some of it inside the United States. It's not a super difficult product to find. It's excellent flavor. And at that 101 proof, it's getting closer to the higher proofed Van Winkles at 107. And it is a weeded mash bill. In fact, according to Maker's Mark Lore, um, Bill Samuels, the original founder of uh, Maker's Mark, was friends with Pappy Van Winkle himself and received instruction on how to put together his weeded mash bill. And whether or not that's true, we really don't know but it makes for a great story and it also indicates that that might be a great alternative for something to sip on. Other weeded mash bills that have pretty good flavor profiles that you might wanna check out would be like Redemption Rye. Um, so that might be a good alternative. Um, Old Fitzgerald is actually an excellent alternative to Pappy Van Winkle. They have several different bottlings of that. Those can be pretty difficult to find, but that's a product that's made by Heaven Hill, and Heaven Hill only has one weeded mash bill of bourbon, and they make that product into Larceny, which is a common everyday shelfer product. Now, I almost didn't mention Larceny because when Larceny is a little bit younger of a product and doesn't age as long, and it comes across a little bit more peanut butter forward and not the, um, the citrus flavor that you get from Van Winkle that's like maybe like an orange zest or an orange oil flavor. Uh, I, I get more of that on the older versions, which the older versions of that are the Old Fitzgerald. Uh, but Old Fitzgerald is a great alternative. Larceny, eh, it's a bit of a stretch, but you know, it is a weeded mash bill. And then the last one that I'll mention based on mash bill would be Rebel Yell uh, Weeded Bourbon. Rebel, Rebel Yell makes a decent product. Their weeded bourbon is, is pretty decent. Are you going to not be able to tell the difference between Rebel Yell and Pappy Van Winkle in a blind? No, I'm not saying that, but it is more of that citrus forward, less of the you know nutmeg and cinnamon and, and clove flavors that you get from the from the rye and rye bourbons. And so that might also be a good alternative. But you don't have to just do alternatives based on mash bill. 
You can also do alternatives based on age. And the reason why I say that is that when you're talking about Van Winkle bourbon, so the 10, 12, 15, 20, and 23 years, old whiskeys have a very distinctive flavor. And I don't particularly like it. In fact, I have owned all of the Van Winkle line except for the Pappy 23 and the uh, Old Rip Van Winkle Family Reserve Rye. I have drank both of those products multiple times. And I got to be honest, I do not like modern releases of Pappy 20 or Pappy 23. The last few years that I've tried them, they just weren't to my palate. They tasted too old. They were blown out. They were missing a lot of that caramel and sweetness because those are, are flavors that can um, kind of go away over time and aging as they, as they lose angel share. And so when I think about that older barrel flavor that people might be attracted to, especially in the Pappy 20 and 23, I get some of those same old barrel characteristics where it just kind of tastes like wood from my eighth recommendation, which is Elijah Craig 18. Not a super inexpensive bottle, but because of its release price, it's often not super hard to find whenever it first is released because that's an annual release product. So Elijah Craig 18 might be a good alternative for uh, Pappy 20 or 23. Certainly a lot easier to find than Pappy 20 or 23. And another one that I'll recommend based on that older barrel flavor would be I.W. Harper 15. Uh, I.W. Harper is also a Heaven Hill product. Um, it is not weeded, neither is the Elijah Craig, but uh, both of them have tons of that barrel flavor that are distinctive characteristics for Pappy 20 and 23. So I would recommend either one of those. Um, but you know, the, the truth is Pappy Van Winkle is a solid bourbon, a well-made bourbon. Anybody who tells you that Pappy Van Winkle is trash or garbage is looking for attention and probably needs to go reconcile with their mother or father, whoever broke them when they were children. It's good bourbon, okay? But is it worth all of the hype? Probably not. And I'll tell you that a lot of people's experience with Pappy and the reason why it's so great to them is because you don't drink Pappy on a random Tuesday night whenever you get home from work for the most part, okay? For the most part, the opportunities that you have to drink Pappy are when you're with people that you care about or when you're celebrating something, right? Or when you're commiserating over something that was bad and you're trying to make yourself feel better and you believe that the spirit can do it. And when you place that much emphasis on a, a drinking experience, it makes it taste better. And so the environmental expectations are probably what make Pappy great more so than the flavor. And with that in mind, there are actually some other whiskeys that I feel like you could fill in any time. Um, is it because they taste like Pappy? No. Is it because they're, they have that old flavor like Pappy does? No. But are they quality products that if you put the emphasis on the drinking experience the same way that you do with Pappy, could you have a similar positive experience drinking them? Absolutely. And one of my go-tos would be Russell's, Russell's Reserve. Um, excellent product from Wild Turkey. Uh, it's got a little bit more proof at 110 proof. It's close to the old rip at 107. Um, again, flavor's not similar but quality of drinking experience, similar in my opinion. Uh, another one would be a quality Knob Creek. Um, Knob Creek products are amazing. A lot of the single barrels are some of the best whiskeys I've ever had. That's a, a higher end um, Jim Beam product. Um, a, a third would just be Elijah Craig, right? Um, Elijah Craig small batch, which is 94 proof. I think that one you could compare in terms of quality of drinking experience to like an old rip lot B 12 year or one of the lower proof Van Winkles. And something that I drink quite a bit of would be Four Roses Small Batch um, and Four Roses Small Batch Select. So the small batch would be more similar in terms of drinking experience to some of the lower proof pappies. And the uh, small batch select would be more similar to some of the, the higher proof pappies. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, you got to drink what you like. And I find that when you put emphasis on the drinking experience, that has more to do with whether or not you enjoy it 
than the actual flavor of the bourbon because if we were honest with ourselves, all of the big Kentucky bourbon distilleries are making a pretty solid product out of great materials and you can enjoy it if you want to. So if this is your first time tuning into Bourbon Real Talk, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our show philosophy. We are about helping people feel connected. And I unfortunately lost my younger brother to suicide a few years ago. And I started looking for ways to help people feel connected because I didn't want anybody to feel the way that my brother felt when he made that decision. And I know that there are people out there that are silently suffering. And I noticed that whiskey had a tendency to bring people together. And so part of the reason why I started this channel was I wanted to help people get connected to whiskey so that whiskey could help connect them to others and to the whiskey community. And I, I also noticed, especially online and even inside some whiskey communities, where people are communicating and when their differences would come up, whether they be political or racial or you know what have you, sexual orientation, whatever their differences, people would say really terrible things to each other, um, hateful things, and indicated that they hated each other. And that made me realize that if you can hate somebody that you've never met, that you don't really know, but you've, you've been introduced to them online, it's just as easy for me to love somebody that I've never met, that I don't really know, that I've only been introduced to online. And that's why I sign off every podcast the same way, and that is this. If you woke up this morning and you were unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you. And I'll see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk. Sorry to you at home if you can hear my dog snoring, uh, but we do have some cute puppers that sometimes like to make a guest appearance, and uh, one of them fell asleep and started snoring. Do you want to be on the Bourbon Room Talk podcast? Huh? Do you want to be on the podcast? You want to get in here and teach people about the bourbons? Huh? Oh man, we're getting all sneezy. Oh, we're so sneezy. You can't have any bourbons. Doggies don't process alcohol good.